Hello, Platts, and welcome to this week where we will be taking a look at gross neuroanatomy, where we will embark on that intriguing journey into the intricate landscape of the brain and its remarkable connections with behavior. I am delighted to have you here as we delve into the captivating realm of the cortex and the organization of the central nervous system. In our previous sessions, we've explored the foundation of neuroscience, understanding the basic building blocks, a little bit about the structure of the brain and the cranial nerves and how they are orchestrated to guide us through our symphony of thoughts and emotions and actions. And so today we ascend another level of our exploration where we focus on that magnificent architecture of the brain itself, the cortex. Often referred to as the crown jewel of the brain, the cortex is the bark, literally. In Latin, cortex means bark, the outer wriggly textured structure of the brain that we see and it plays a pivotal role in shaping our perceptions and memories and decision making and conscious experiences in fact it it makes us who we are its convoluted structure really is a testament to the complexity of the human mind housing an array of regions each associated with unique functions and abilities and as we uncover the layers of the cortex, we'll discuss its various lobes and their specific contributions to sensory processing and motor control and language and executive functions. Moreover, we'll journey beyond the cortex into the intricate web of the central nervous system, examining how the brain communicates with the spinal cord and the myriad ways in which they collaborate to coordinate our every movement and sensation. Now, understanding gross neuroanatomy is akin to holding a map that guides us through a labyrinth of human behavior. And this knowledge really lays the groundwork for comprehending neurological disorders and cognitive processes, and even the profound philosophical questions surrounding consciousness itself. So, now, a little brain joke for you this week. So, did you hear about the neuron who tried to impress the cortex at a party? It said, hey cortex, I've got all these connections and synapses. I'm the life of the brain. <laughs> and the cortex replied, well, that's impressive. But I've got billions of neurons reporting to me. I guess... You could say, I am the brain's billionaire. <laughs> yeah, not good enough? Well, here's another one for you. Why did the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and temporal lobe refuse to invite the cerebellum to their party? Because they heard that he was just a little too unbalanced on the dance floor. Nope. Well. Maybe by the end of this lecture, you'll appreciate how good a joke that one was. <laughs> so let's continue on and delve into the fascinating story of Brodmann's discovery of areas of the brain and the profound impact it has had on our understanding of cortical organizations. So sometimes you will see uh, maps of brains with a bunch of little numbers on them. And if you've ever wondered why there are those numbers, well, it's because of a fellow by the name of Corbin and Brodmann. And so our story takes us to the late 19th and early 20th century, where this German neurologist and psycho psychiatrist named Corbinian Brodmann was at the forefront of neuroanatomical research. And Brodmann was captivated by the complex structure of the cerebral cortex and was determined to unravel its mysteries. And using some cutting edge staining techniques and meticulously histological examinations, Brodmann began to map 
the human brain, distinguishing it into numerous distinct areas based on its cellular architecture, what we now call cytoarchitecture. And he recognized that different regions of the brain had very distinct neurological compositions, cellular compositions, and these variations could hold the key to understanding the brain's functional specialization. So in 1909, Brodmann published his groundbreaking work in a lithograph that can be translated as the comparative localization theory of the cerebral cortex. And in this monograph, he meticulously delineated 52 distinct areas of the cerebral cortex in the human brain, each with its own unique cellular structure and potential functions. And his work was a significant departure from the traditional methods of anatomical brain mapping, which pr primarily relied on gross observations. He was looking at something much more closely. And so the legacy and impact of Brodmann's cortical mapping has had a profound impact upon the field of neuroscience. His areas, now known as Brodmann's areas, became fundamental references for researchers and clinicians alike. And these numbered regions not only provided a functional map of the brain, but also laid the groundwork for understanding the relationship between brain structure and the function and behavior of an individual. So over time, as technology advanced, his work was first validated and then expanded upon through various neuroimaging techniques such as functional MRIs and P PET scans, uh, positron emission tomography scans, and this allows researchers to correlate specific cognitive functions with distinct areas of the brain, confirming many of Brodmann's initial observations. Now, of course, some of them have been revised and changed a little bit, but overall, Brodmann's legacy has left an indelible mark on our understanding of the brain's organization and, of course, its function. His work has paved the way for the development of neuropsychology as a field, and our comprehension of how brain regions contribute to various behaviors and cognitive processes. And even though the boundaries of Brodmann's areas have been defined and redefined by modern research, his systemic approach to mapping the brain remains really a cornerstone of neuroanatomy. Now, uh, in order to understand gross neuroanatomy, and focusing on the cortex and s s the uh, central nervous system organization, I want to kind of highlight a few things as we kind of go through. Um, the first thing I want to kind of highlight is some key terms for understanding the brain. So in order to navigate the intricate landscape of the brain, it's crucial to grasp some key anatomical terms that help us understand the relationship between different parts. Now, here's a little bit of a highlight, some, some terms that it'll be important for you to remember. Rostral. The term rostral refers to the direction toward the forehead or nose. It's often used to describe the structures closer to the front of the brain. Then there's dorsal, and this term pertains to the top of the brain, or a structure closer to the top. It's also known as superior in some context, if you're talking about something related to something else. And then a sulcus, and the plural of that would be a sulci. A sulcus is a groove or indentation in the brain surface. So these sulci play a vital role in defining the different gyri, the ridges of the cerebral cortex. So when you're looking at it, you can kind of see that there's certain uh, sulci that are like deep valleys that help you to kind of find where you are in the cortex. So that's the first thing we're going to kind of look at is some uh, key terms. Next I want to kind of explore a little bit of gross neuroanatomy and in this section we'll look a little closer at the overall structure of the brain and its major divisions. 
and we'll discuss the brain's three main parts, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. And so a key term there, something to kind of be mindful of, would be the forebrain. The forebrain is that largest part of the brain and includes the cerebral hemispheres and the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And it's responsible for many complex cognitive functions and sensory processes and emotional regulation. Then there is, of course, section three. And this was where we'll look at the divisions of various areas of the cortex. So the cortex, uh, with its intricate foldings and specialized areas, is a centerpiece of cognitive and sensory processes. So we'll examine how the different regions of the cortex are divided and what functions they serve. And so a key term for there would be say the primary motor cortex and so that's located in the frontal lobe and this in the back part of the frontal lobe and this area is responsible for initiating voluntary motor movements and coordinating muscular activity and then we have the last section where we'll take a look at the organization of the central nervous system and our a uh, deep dive into the organization of the central nervous system will help us to kind of explore a little bit about how the brain communicates with the rest of the body through the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. So a key term to be mindful of here is the spinal cord. And that's a long, thin, tubular structure that runs from the brain stem to the lumbar region. And it plays a crucial role, as I'm sure you know, in transmitting sensory and motor information between the brain and the rest of the body. And understanding these key terms and concepts is essential for comprehending the intricate connections between the brain structures and their impact on behavior as a whole. So let's continue on and explore a little bit about the brain and its complex organization by taking a look at uh, some key terms. First term I want to kind of highlight is the cerebral hemispheres. And what is the cerebral hemispheres? Well, the brain is divided into two hemispheres, the right and the left, which are connected by a bundle of fibers called the corpus callosum. And each hemisphere is responsible for controlling the opposite side of the body and is associated with various functions such as language, reasoning, and spatial awareness. Now, another term is lateralization. And this term refers to the specialization of functions in each hemisphere of the brain. Now, while both hemispheres work together, Certain functions, like language processing, typically on the left hemisphere, and spatial reasoning, typically on the right hemisphere, are often more dominant in one hemisphere. Then the idea of lobes of the brain. And here's the idea that the cerebral cortex is divided into four main lobes. There is the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And each lobe is associated with specific functions and behaviors. For instance, the frontal lobe is responsible for executive functions like moral reasoning, decision making, and problem solving. And while the occipital lobe is primarily involved in uh, visual processing, Okay, another term that I've already mentioned a little bit about is sulci and gyri. Uh, the surface of the cortex, as I've already mentioned, is characterized by folds and creases. And the folds are called gyri, and, and the grooves or indentations are called sulci. And these features increase the brain surface area, allowing for more neurons and cognitive capabilities. Then there is something known as the central sulcus, also known as the fissure of Rolando or the central sulcus of Rolando. 
And this prominent sulcus separates the frontal and parietal lobes. And so it plays a crucial role in demarcating the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe from the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. Then there is something known as the longitudinal fissure, which is a deep groove running the midline of the brain, dividing it into that left and right hemispheres. Another area or, or areas in the brain are Broca's area and Wernicke's era, area. And these two areas are critical for language related functioning. The primary located in the left hemisphere and Broca's area in the frontal lobe uh, and is involved with the language production, while Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe is associated with language comprehension. Then there is something known as the sylvian fissure or the lateral sulcus. And this is a prominent fissure that separates the temporal lobe from the frontal and parietal lobes and it was named after the French anatomist and surgeon Marc Sivian. Now another term is the cerebral cortex. We've already mentioned what that is. That is of course the outermost layer of the cerebrum, that largest part of the brain and it's responsible for our higher cognitive functions, our sensory processing and motor control and the cortex is divided as i've already mentioned into various areas or lobes that contribute to the specific functions essentially it is our conscious self now there are various planes that sometimes you will hear about uh, something known as the coronal or the and the sagittal and the axial planes. And these are simply reference planes used in neuroanatomy to describe the three dimensional structure of the brain. So the coronal plane divides the brain into front and back sections. The sagittal plane divides it into the left and right halves. And the axial plane divides it into the upper and lower parts. And so mastering all of these terms will really go a long way in aiding you in comprehending the intricate relationship and the divisions within the brain. So it'll enhance your understanding of really how these various parts work in harmony to create our thoughts and our emotions and of course our behaviors. So let's uh, dive in now into the gross neuroanatomy and focus on the brain's overall structure. So we'll divide our coverage here into three sections. So we'll start in kind of our first section here where we look at the main divisions of the brain. And some of these terms, this is the only time that you will hear about them and others you will, we will be going back to quite a bit. So I want to kind of start off by just reminding you the basics. The human brain is our command center and it has this wonderful complexity to it. And as this very intricate organ, it's divided up into three main divisions, the forebrain, the midbrain and the hindbrain. Now there's a term that you will often hear a lot. And that term is cephalon. Don't be intimidated by it. The term cephalon just means head. So if you hear the term cephalon, know that it just means that there's something to do with the head. So for example, cephalitis is simply an infection in the head. That's all it really is. So don't be too intimidated by the terms. So first off, let's take a look at the forebrain. And so the forebrain is the seat of our complexity of who we are. It's the largest and most developed part of the brain. 
and it plays a central role in our higher cognitive functions. And you can divide the forebrain into two main components, the telencephalon and the diencephalon. Now, the diencephalon is that part of the forebrain that includes the thalamus and hypothalamus. And so the thalamus acts as it's literally a waiting station. Uh, and so it is kind of a relay station. It's kind of um, uh, the central station for sensory information. And, and it's a place where sensory information goes and then is redirected to the appropriate areas. So it's like a busy switchboard routing calls to the right departments. And the hypothalamus, on the other hand, regulates essential functions such as hunger and thirst and basic things like body temperature and even our body's internal clock and its circadian rhythm. Then there's the telencephalon. If you look and kind of put your hand over your forehead, you kind of know where this telencephalon is. The telencephalon is that outermost part of the brain and is the highly developed part and what makes humans humans. And it's primarily composed of the cerebral hemispheres, which are responsible for our conscious thought, our decision-making, and our sensory perception. The cortex, the outer layer of the cerebral cortex, is folded into gyri, those ridges and sulci, the grooves, uh, increasing its surface area. And this expansion enables more neurons to be packed into the limited space of the skull, giving us our remarkable cognitive abilities. So that is the forebrain in a nutshell. Then we have the midbrain. And the midbrain is that bridging of sensory and motor function. So if we move to the midbrain, uh, we, we have this area that is sometimes called the mesencephalon. And this is a small but crucial section that acts as a bridge between the forebrain and the hindbrain. And so it's involved in relaying sensory and motor information and is a key player in functions like visual and auditory reflexes. And it houses structures like the superior and inferior colliculi, which contribute to visual and auditory processing respectively. Now, um, here's uh, just a little bit of a picture. If your brother or sister jump out from behind a door and scare you and your arms automatically go up and you scream well that's basically your mesencephalon taking over and trying to protect you your midbrain it moves really fast and so it can do things that we when we don't have time to think about them it will take over then we have our hind brain and that's kind of our coordination and our vital function section so the hind brain is located at the back of the brain and the bottom of the brain. It contains the structures responsible for keeping us alive, our vital functions and our coordination of movements. So things like walking and sitting down and simply tying our shoes. We don't have to consciously think about tying our shoes. And just think how wonderful it is that we don't have to do that. We just do it. And that is thanks to our hindbrain. So the two regions of the hindbrain are the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. So the metencephalon is the region that includes the cerebellum and pons. And the cerebellum is often referred to as the little brain and is responsible for coordinating movements and balance and posture. And the pons, with its bridge-like appearance, connects the cerebellum to the rest of the brain and helps regulate things like breathing and facial expression as well as simplifying down some of those very complicated coordination things that we don't have to think about. And then there is the myelencephalon and the myelencephalon comprises things like the medulla oblongata. So 
when you are in a sheer and utter panic and screaming and your arms are flailing or you're in a blind rage, that's when your medulla oblongata is taken over. It controls basic things like your heart rate and your blood pressure and your breathing. And it's a vital link between the brain core, the spinal cord and the brain. And so the myelencephalon is essential for our survival. Even when we're not consciously aware of it, it does an absolutely incredible amount of work. So it's one of those areas that we absolutely need in order to survive. And that's probably why it's buried so deep within us. The next part I want to kind of take a look at within the uh, exploration of the cortex is the uh, looking at just some basics of the divisions of the cortex. So if we were to kind of think just in terms of the cerebral cortex again, we have the gyri and sulci of the cerebral cortex. So we need to kind of remember, and I'm going to keep repeating this one over and over again so that you really kind of get it in your minds, that the cerebral cortex is characterized by its distinctive patterns of folds and grooves. And these folds are called gyri, and they increase the surface area of the cortex, allowing for the greater number of neurons. So the grooves, the, the valleys, known as the sulci, separate the gyre, which are kind of the hills, and serve as landmarks for identifying different cortical regions. So let's take a look now at the lobes. Remember, the lobes are organizational areas of the cortex and we can kind of identify where they are based upon uh, the various sulci that we see. So the frontal lobe, remember, is that executive area. So the frontal lobe is located in the front of the brain. Uh, this lobe plays really a cru crucial role in executive functions such as decision-making, moral reasoning, problem solving, planning, and is really our expression of our personality. Yeah. So this also is where your conscious motor cortex lies, um, which is found at the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe and is responsible for initiating voluntary motor movements. Then we have the parietal lobe, and the parietal lobe is positioned just behind the frontal lobe in the top of your head, and the parietal lobe is involved in sensory processing, a little bit of spatial awareness, and as well as a little bit with attention. And the primary somatosensory cortex is here, and it's located in the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe. And this receives and processes sensory information from different parts of the body. Then there is the temporal lobes, the right and the left temporal lobes. Remember with all of the, the lobes, that's the right and the left parts of them. So with the temporal lobe, which is situated on the sides of the brain, the temporal lobe is, is particularly on the left, is essential for auditory processing and for memory formation and language comprehension. And then partly underneath that, we have the hippocampus, which is a structure within that under part of the temporal lobe and is critical for memory consolidation. Then we have, of course, the occipital lobe. And the occipital lobe is at the back of the brain and is responsible for your visual processing. So the primary visual cortex located in the occipital lobe receives and interprets visual information from the eye. So you don't actually see, you have your sense organ for seeing in the front of your head, but 
the actual seeing, the processing of that information occurs in the back of your head. Isn't that fascinating? So there's also some association areas and specialized regions. And be, so beyond those primary cortices responsible for the specific functions, the cortex also contains association areas that integrate sensory information and facilitate some complex cognitive processes. Uh, additionally, there are specialized regions within each lobe, such as Broca's area for language production in the back part of the left side of the frontal lobe, and the fusiform face area in the temporal lobe for recognizing faces. There is also, for example, in the back of the temporal lobe and kind of bleeding off into the lower part of the parietal lobe and into the occipital lobe is a large association area that is um, crucial for strong creative individuals. So um, some mental processes like creativity take up many different parts of the brain. And again, just a reminder that there is hemispheric lateralization, and that is that while both hemispheres of the cortex work together, they also exhibit lateralization, meaning that certain functions are more dominant in one hemisphere. So, for example, language processing is often lateralized to the left hemisphere in the in a right-handed individual particularly. So understanding the divisions and functions of the cerebral cortex provides us with a deeper appreciation of how this intricate structure orchestrates our perceptions and memories and emotions and actions. And I think that's just absolutely wonderful. So we're going to pause there and let's you take a little bit of a break and when we come back we'll continue on taking a look at the gross anatomy of the brain and i'll see you in a little while you take care goodbye